the Kenyan people, I think after being locked up for two years, have been starving for this. And all they have is this overwhelming emotion of love and outreach. And they're so happy to see people again and to hug people again and not to have restrictions that there's just this instant emotion of unity and something that Canada, I think, has been striving for since the country was uh, was established. Hello there. It's been quite a while since I've made my last podcast. I think the last one was with Dinesh D'Souza a couple months ago. Uh, a lot has happened since then, but we're back now. Uh, I'm going to be producing a lot more content going forward. And boy, what a time to be alive in Canada. There's a lot going on. And today we're going to be speaking at a man who is at the center of it, but it's not just about him. Benjamin Dichter is an organizer for the Freedom Convoy. Uh, I'm going to be speaking to him today about everything going on, what's going to happen in the future, legacy media, and so on. I think you're really going to like this conversation. Please listen to the end. I guarantee you'll enjoy it. I'm Angelo Sodoro, and this is Cancel This. All right, Benjamin, thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure. Good to talk to you. So you, uh, your movement, I don't want to say it's just you because it's more of a collective thing. That's right. But what you're doing has been the center of the world right now. And I'm not exaggerating because the entire world is looking at Canada of all places, where, to be honest with you, up until a month ago, I was completely jaded thinking we're going to be the last ones to do anything because we're so passive as a country. But you've yeah. made me look like an idiot and uh, <laughs> I was completely wrong. So tell me what the vibe is right now in Ottawa. Well, well the first thing is, you know, it's not me. Uh, there's a, a, a giant team behind us and started really with Chris, Bridget and Tamara in Alberta. And they, you know, got all their friends together and said, let's do a convoy and we'll try a GoFundMe. Who knows? Maybe we'll get, you know, $20,000 for some fuel expenses and for some food for the journey. And, you know, the next day, I think it was the next day or two. I think it was the next day. Uh, I keep forgetting to ask Tamara. But uh, all of a sudden they had like $150,000 in the bank and it was growing exponentially and Tamara freaked out. She's like, oh, okay, I got to get a bunch of friends, whatever. So she called me and she said, listen, can you help with uh, messaging, social media? Uh, you know, I have a truck as well. So it kind of everything, you know, the world aligned and, uh, you know, maybe it is a simulation. Maybe Scott Adams and Elon Musk are correct. Uh, or maybe just uh, the, it, it just, I don't know. It, it was too perfect. It was too perfect to what happened. And um, so here we are, uh, center of the world. I, I don't feel like it, you know, here in my hotel, just doing a couple of interviews, living my life like, like always, and getting thousands and thousands of messages from people trying to, you know, sift through them and funnel them and, um yeah, it's 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 amazing. Yeah, I, I don't know. There's there's such there's lack of, you know, the, the right word to give the feel for the vibe of what's going on. It's more than it's just positive, um, loving, caring, uh, and unif It's so unified, and you know, I give this example, I've given this example a number of times, of when I was first here. And I went to the, uh, the park behind Parliament and this wall of thousands of people from Quebec walking into Canada, sorry, walking into an Ontario with their Canadian flags and their Quebec flags and their signs. And they walked up to Parliament Hill and they met with all these people from Western Canada, from Ontario, from Saskatchewan, Alberta, whatever started hugging each other, meeting each other because they had the same signs. You know, there's the, a couple of pictures I took where one guy's got a sign that says freedom and the guy next to him says liberté. But, and they couldn't talk to each other, but they're hanging out with each other and trying to learn how to talk to each other and hugging and looking at the trucks and talking to people. And it's just people coming up to them, taking pictures between the two of them. Um, that's been the vibe. Like, I feel like, and it's, it's not because of us, it's because of the Canadian people. I think after being locked up for two years, I've been starving for this. 
and all they have is this overwhelming emotion of love and outreach and they're so happy to see people again and to hug people again and not to have restrictions that there's just this instant emotion of unity and something that Canada, I think, has been striving for since the country was uh, was established. And it's just a beautiful thing to see. And I say this is I, I say often this is what happens when politicians and the media get out of the way. Yeah, you know, I was telling you before we started recording that I've been on the news desk on the weekends because uh, I wanted something lax to begin with. And uh, and of course, you guys go and, and do what you did. So it's been a busy time. And, you know, sitting there, you know, I, I'm the one writing, dealing with social media. We have reporters on the ground. But seeing these videos come in, every time a video come, came in, I just looked at it and, and thought, geez, this is nuts. This is this is huge. And it's not only like the freedom factor that we talk about, that people are celebrating their freedom, but it is what you're saying in the sense that you're seeing people embrace each other in a way that we haven't seen in a long time, because for two years we were told quite literally to stay away from each other. And you see these videos of indigenous drum circles or or clan mother Noreen of Yellowknife blessing the convoy or tons of of Sikhs like so many Sikhs I've seen a a, a ton here even on the overpasses in Vancouver because we have such a prominent Sikh community that is involved in trucking Uh, you have all of that and it's it's quite frankly a love fest with bouncy castles but on the flip side I mean I've been flabbergasted I don't think I've ever seen in my entire career and mind you I'm 25 so I'm, I'm a baby but I've never mm-hmm. seen in my entire career in journalism more disinformation than I have around this. It's been insane to witness. Apparently, you're a Russian. You're a Russian spy, <laughs> white supremacist. I mean, it's yeah. just it's been out of control. What has been your reaction to that from legacy media? Um, I think it's hysterical. Um, it's lovely to see them continue to double down and shoot themselves in the foot and destroy any credibility they might have had. Uh, They've given me so many concrete examples so that now when I say it's fake news, I don't have to go back two or three months or whatever. I can say, well, I can look at Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I can give you all sorts of examples. It's all completely fake and it's killing them. It's destroying their reputations. And that's also part of the reason when we've had our press conferences, our official ones, uh, the fake news media, I mean, the the Toronto Star and the CBC were the first ones to be banned. That was the motivation behind keeping them out of this and forcing them to deal with organizations like yours, like the Post Millennium and others, because I'm sorry, you guys are credible. And... There's nothing, there's nothing to gain for us for having a news conference where some activist in a journalism suit comes to with their, you know, law, their gigantic phallic symbol of a camera that's overkill that nobody needs. With a crew of three other people, they take up a third of the floor space to not ask questions, but to hurl accusations at you and then double down on it like white supremacists. So I'm Jewish. Uh, I, I, I have no idea how I am both a Nazi and Jewish, but that's the level of intelligence of these people and their understanding of history. They know nothing. They just know to call people names and to yell at them and turn that into some misleading headline. That's why they're not involved. They're, they're not invited. And then on top of that, They don't get any views. So we're going to sit there. We're going to be harassed. Nobody wants to ask us a question. We'll be able to get a word in edgewise. They'll go home. They'll spend our taxpayer money editing it down. And then no one's going to watch it. I have no interest in that. Sorry. Their their business model doesn't meet uh, the most basic level of journalistic integrity. And I'm just not going to entertain that. You know, the the big realization that I've had with this movement is that it mm-hmm. is at a very deep level, 
a type of information war with the media because I was telling my, my reporter this on the ground. You know, I'll give you an example. You have okay. one idiot with a Confederate flag. <laughs> we have footage of him wearing like three ski masks and sunglasses um, and basically being told to get out of here. Who are you? And he leaves yeah. because he's clearly some bad actor. And we report on that. But meanwhile, you have legacy media saying, look what they're promoting. Look what's going on. It, there's two worlds that are completely different. It's the same with, you know, the, some idiot who nobody's yeah. able to find that brought a swastika flag that we've collectively offered $10,000 to anyone who can identify. And he's mm -hmm. like the most elusive person in the world. Yeah. So, you know, not to sound tinfoil hatty, but the reality is that there are bad actors, right? I mean, I'll give you an example just from yesterday. This was an amazing story we wrote. Okay. Bernie Farber. I don't know oh. if you saw this, but Bernie Farber, chair of the Anti-Hate uh, anti Network of Canada, posts I call a picture. It hate .ca. anti hate.ca. Anti hate.ca, whatever it is. <laughs> no, and just hate.ca. Just, just hate.ca. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> um, he posts a picture of like some ridiculous anti Semitic flyer saying, My friend just found this in Ottawa. It gets immediately retweeted by name a, a legacy media pundit, all of them. They immediately retweet yeah. it saying, This is vile, disgusting. Jonathan Kay searched the image on Google. It's from Miami from three weeks ago, completely unrelated to, to Ottawa. Yeah. So he outright, like he just made it up. Like yeah. these people are just making stuff up. So sorry to go on a rant here, but it's very frustrating. Like as someone who's trying to report legitimately to witness the media trying so hard to besmirch a group of well-meaning people. It, it's mm -hmm. and they're so disappointed there wasn't an insurrection. Oh, so, yeah. it, it, anyways, I mean, I don't, I don't know what your reaction to that is, but it, it sounds like you're having a lot of fun. Honestly, some of you people are asking me all this week, "How are you feeling? How is it? You know, whatever." I'm like, well, you know, I started a few days ago with um, parking my car in a tree, <laughs> and then the next day, between all of this, so I parked my car in a tree as I was trying to get to Ottawa to do like a live interview with Steven Crowder. And uh, unfortunately, I had to go to some little small town that had no cell phone signal, signal on my carrier, uh, no Uber, no uh, rental cars, nothing. And I said to his producer, I'm like, uh, we can do it from the Tim Hortons. It's very Canadian, right? <laughs> and we did. And it was great. Uh, and then, you know, the following day at night, um, I, the mayor doesn't salt the, the uh, sidewalks, you know, Mr. The concerned mayor here about the horns uh, doesn't care the fact that everybody is falling and breaking limbs all over the place. I, I shattered my ankle and was in the hospital for 10 hours. But what are you going to do? That's, uh, that's life. You know, you just got to make the best of it. And people are asking, how are you, you know, are, are you stressed? Well, like, this is the most fun thing I've ever done. It's hysterical. I, it's great because you're all, the, the reward is so amazing to see all of these people coming together, unifying, bringing their children, all these kids who, you know, the, the trucking industry had, I don't know what sort of reputation it would have had before, but more, you know, very working class sort of thing. And now you have these little kids how many kids I've asked have been with their families here with signs? I'm like, are you going to grow up and be a trucker? So like, yeah, I want to be a trucker, right? Because kids love trucks and toys. But I think we've solved the supply the supply chain issue and the driver shortage issue. Just give it a few years; it'll self correct. And the reward of and it's not because of any individual; it's all of us coming together and the people who've promote, who've put the videos together. The people have written songs about it. The reward, reward of seeing people inspired for the first time in years is I, 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 can't, I can't tell you how rewarding that feeling is to see that to, to think that you're part of the cog in the wheel that's helping people rediscover their passion for Canada. Like I did an interview just before you with um, another, uh, well, she's a, she's a small creator. Um, she's a uh, freelance journalist in France, but she's from here. And she said to me, I used to be a separatist. I'm not a separatist anymore. I went and bought a Canadian flag last year, sorry, last week, 
because now I'm proud to be part of Canada because we're all unifying and respecting each other. And we now all know where the problem is. It's not with the people. We all understand that we have different cultures across the, can- across the country and we're accepting of each other's cultures, right? And I think it's, it's, it's not a fault, it's a feature. Well, now the separatists are realizing it's not a fault, it's a feature, that I can be, you know, French-Canadian, I can be you know, a Quebecois and still be part of what it is to be Canadian and have love and respect for the 300 cowboys that mounted their horses to go to the border in Alberta. <coughs> it's... I don't know. I don't know how to communicate that feeling, but it is it is amazing. Well, in terms of the effect, <laughs> something I wanted to ask you about is, I mean, here's just quick facts. You guys do this. Quebec drops its vaccine uh, tax that they're doing. Yeah. Saskatchewan yeah. all of a sudden decides that it's time to end restrictions. Alberta is heading that way. Even BC with our NDP government is saying we need to begin transitioning um, you you have the leader uh, of the Conservative Party get thrown out on his ass, um, and you have probably the most vocally supportive MP stepping up to lead. All these things together, mind you, none of these bodies, provinces, whoever, will say that the truckers had anything to do with it. They'll say, oh, it's nothing to do with truckers. Nothing yeah. to do with truckers. We just <laughs> we were going to send everyone to camps, but we decided not to now. Um, Mm. so is that like, like realistically without, you know, tooting your own horn, do you think you've had an effect to that degree that, I mean, I mean, there's two different things with the conservative party and and the provinces, but do you think you've had an effect? Uh, I believe, I believe all the truckers, everybody involved has, I think, you know, a part of the, the motivating worldview that that I've been using with with all of this and communicating to the team and all that sort of stuff. There's a podcaster I very much like uh, by the name of Scott Adams, and he brings up the the point regularly. And I believe he's right. And this was kind of the foundation for it of the pandemic is over when the people decide it's over. It's not up to the government. The government might think it's up to them, but it's not. And it's over when your neighbors, your family, everybody around you, the majority of people just don't want to wear a mask anymore. That's that's how our system operates here. It's a little bit clunky. There's no question. Uh, it could be better. But in general, that's the way it works. And what you're seeing is the people saying the pandemic's over. You just haven't realized it, government. So we're going to sit here until you understand that the pandemic's over. Even if COVID... I mean, we're down to the Omicron, which is, you know, it spread so fast because its lethality is so low. Like it is virology number 101. You, you learn this in grade seven sort of thing, right? Um, so I think we're, we're, we're at that point. They just haven't gotten the hints. Some people in government, um, and there, there are a variety of different motivations we can speculate on, but that doesn't change anything, so there's no point. But it's over. They haven't realized it. Some people, uh, Scott Moe, like here's an example of the problems we're dealing with still. You know, politicians are famous for one, for many things, lying, but also being fence sitters, right? And Scott Moe still doesn't get it. He released a statement saying we're going to end the mandates in Saskatchewan. Uh, we're not going to have a provincial passport. But what we'll do is we're going int- to introduce a digital ID system. No, 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 no. You're not getting it. That, no, Scott, that's not going to happen because we're going to tell you that's not going to happen. And at some point he's going to realize it. Yeah, it is frustrating that, you know, a lot of people complain about the politicians, but it seems like the politicians themselves aren't really people in the sense that they are mirrors to whatever is seemingly popular in the zeitgeist in that moment. And I've been telling people as a joke, the minute it hits 50 plus one percent of Canada being done with this, they're all good all of a sudden are going to be like oh yeah of course it's over and it's frustrating to people who have seen it coming but it's sort of the reality of human nature and before we go on i want to note it's stupid that i have to note this but it's the world we live in um you're not anti-vax i'm not anti-vax the movement is not anti-vax it's anti-mandate a lot of the truckers are vaccinated right yeah 
are, are, are most of the truckers vaccinated? Like, what's your vibe there? Oh, um, honestly, I haven't asked. Uh, it comes up once in a while, and some people are anti are not vaxxed. Some people uh, are. Some people aren't. Uh, I'm vaxxed, and uh, not only am I vaxxed, I usually get the, the, the flu vaccine every year. Not oh, wow. every year, but usually do. Um, so when they go to, oh, yeah, these people are all anti-vaxxers, like, no, there's, like, all people were individuals, and we have different ideas and different reasons for making our choices in our lives. We're not collectivists. And there are some people here who are against or strongly against the COVID vaccine for they may have had issues with their family. Like, I have a, I have a friend who's um, uh, quite well known who had one, had the first vaccine and just had such horrible negative reactions from a biological standpoint. I don't want to get into more than that, but that her doctor recommended to her saying, don't get the second vaccine. Just let's let's wait it out. I don't think you're responding well to it, which is great. That's her, that's, that's her business. That's between her and her doctor. And that's what we need to go back to. The fact yeah. that we have privacy and people make individual medical decisions, right? Uh, so I haven't asked any of these people uh, who are vax, but you know, a surprising the, the people you think who would be unvaccinated are vaccinated, and the people you think uh, are vaccinated aren't. So I can't even guess anymore, right? Yeah, and yeah. I don't care because it's none of my business. Well, that that and that's exactly it. Is that it is a private private medical thing, right? <laughs> yeah. um, I wanted to ask about going forward, you know, we had this news about GoFundMe um, mm -hmm. going woke and now they did, I guess they decided to automatically refund everyone. Um, Cause what I thought was happening is when they said you have to request, I thought, oh, they're trying to keep that 5%. Um, is that, is that yeah. sort of what you thought was happening? Like why, why would you have to request your donation back? Uh, yeah, it seemed to be that, well, I think just because they're uh, antagonistic towards us and anybody involved in freedom for some reason, that's a problem for GoFundMe. Okay, that's their decision. They uh, initially suggested that people can request their money back, but if they don't by a certain date, I don't remember what it was, then they will be do donating it to a charity of their choice. Right. So like BLM and, or something? What, what's the charity? Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> so then uh, it's stealing from us and giving to BLM. Great. Um, so then somebody at uh, Give, Send, Go, the current um, uh, pro company we're using, they, um, they put out a tweet saying, uh, suggesting to everybody, this is what you can do, is request a chargeback on your credit card. That'll cost $15.00 to every transaction and when all the money's gone they would uh, go it would have cost gofundme in excess of a million dollars so it's amazing how quickly then the process of requesting your um your refund just became automated uh, automatically automated by gofundme wow you know the threat of losing a million dollars right and then the next thing that happened was the attorney general of florida and Ron DeSantis both came out with statements saying um, this is fraudulent and, pro and possibly criminal behavior by GoFundMe. It's time for an inquiry. And uh, very shortly after, GoFundMe said, okay, we're just going to automatically refund everybody. So Ron DeSantis uh, saving the world from another country. You know, it's really great. He keeps knocking it out of the park every time. <laughs> you got to give that guy credit. Yeah. So that's that's incredible. So then you're on Give, Send, Go. For those of you who don't know, Give, Send, Go is, is I guess, a Christian crowdfunding alternative to GoFundMe. I know even they dealt with issues. I think they got uh, they had a DDoS attack. They're having some server issues. It seems to be better now. But how much have you raised there now? Well, first, they were having five million DDoS attacks an hour. Wow. Yeah. So just... 5 million bot attacks using this process to try to uh, disrupt the website. So somebody's really, really motivated uh, to ensure this movement doesn't grow. And um, it was it was almost impossible to use the site. Like, I think I couldn't get on for seven hours. I think I, I saw the page appear once, but really I couldn't get on. 
And even with that, because uh, they couldn't handle uh, the amount of traffic and bandwidth required because they were just overloaded in every possible metric. Uh, we raised 1.5 million in the first 12 to 18 hours, if I'm not mistaken. Somebody told me uh, a couple of hours ago when I started sat down to start doing interviews, I, I don't know if this is true, I have to confirm it, but somebody told me we're at about uh, $4 million uh, so far. And then something really interesting, and I'm going to have a big, uh, you know, a big announcement about this later on the week. We may have a press conference around it. Is some people, you know, from the Bitcoin community noticed that I put, you know, Bitcoin Hodler on my my Twitter account, and they started sending me messages saying we've been uh, raising uh, Bitcoin for you guys. We've been, you know, collecting donations. And we're getting some momentum. So we want to talk to you about, you know, how can we support you guys with Bitcoin? Uh, so I just had a very, very interesting meeting about that this morning. And we're going to have a, a very lar- a very significant announcement in a couple of days. That's amazing. That that's just show how everybody across the political spectrum. And some of these, some of these guys I talked to, they're definitely on the opposite end of the political spectrum in many respects, not all. And but it's everybody wants their freedom and everybody wants the government to get out of their lives. Simple as that. Right. Even those who say, oh, the government should have these powers, whatever. Yeah. Until it starts, the boot of the government is on their neck. Then all of a sudden they very quickly uh, modify their worldview to say, well, I don't like it this way. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, so, I, I mean, and I think it also goes back to this simple thing of if it doesn't affect people, they don't care. Like there's this, uh, yeah. I saw a bunch of conservatives were making fun of this Ottawa millionaire lawyer who was filming from his apartment complaining about the honking. And it's like, yeah, you live in a, a $5 million apartment. You make probably over a million dollars a year. Mm-hmm. You don't care. You are you are the bourgeoisie, which is so funny because they think they're, they're the proletariat. But they, you know, you don't understand yeah. that these people's lives are being ruined. So what do you expect exactly? Like, what do you yeah, expect they, they, to happen? I, it's like, I'm sorry if the honking bothers you, but this family that has lost their entire business, their farm, their property, and is living in destitute in Alberta and has been for the past two years, they've exhausted all of their savings, everything they had. I'm sorry that the honking's annoying, but the honking, by the way, is not has not been going on at night. And um, but let's how about some compassion for these people? But it's amazing the buggy moral code of people on the left where they can cherry pick when they have compassion for people. And it always seems to be centered around uh, political beliefs for some reason. Yeah. Oh, definitely. It's always related to the, the, how terrible capitalism is and so on. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, meanwhile, you have someone who can solve the issue in Justin Trudeau, who's literally fled the city like it's Rome <laughs> being taken over. And he's God knows where. He coincidentally got COVID. Um, yeah. I, I mean, that's just another thing that that's hilarious. But before we get to that, I wanted to ask you, what happened last night? I mean, we're recording this on um, on Monday. Uh, what happened last night? We, we got some reporting that said that people were beginning to get arrested. Is that accurate? Still, the details are still a little bit fuzzy on my end. I reached out to the command center this morning. And, uh, you know, Tom Quiggin does the daily intelligence brief in the morning that we send out to everybody. Um, so I reached out and say, what's the story? We're, we're getting all sorts of mixed messages as we have been this entire time. Right. So what's true? What's not true from the, the best that I can tell right now, but I'm, I'm going to be confirming this later on in the afternoon is some people were, you know, it's an intimidation tactic. You know, people are picked up for mischief, taken down to the station, they're given a ticket, and then they're left. They're they're let free to go. Um, I don't want to trivialize it if that's, if it was something more. I I don't, from what I understand, I don't think there was any, you know, arrest, arrest in the traditional sense. It's just intimidation tactics. Uh, They're putting up... um, a couple of additional barriers last night, trying to separate trucks over time. 
uh, the people, the, clearly the officers, uh, we've been in, interacting with a lot of them on the uh, on the ground level. Uh, many of us have family in policing, as I do. So we're quite sympathetic to the position they're being put in by uh, by the brass in policing and by our, our political class. So there's a lot of that going on. There's jerry cans being seized. Uh, we don't know under what lawful uh, order they are having their property seized. It's completely illegal. Uh, they, they probably know that. And the city of Ottawa is li- and its police services are likely going to see significant legal troubles in the near future, which is something that we're working on. Uh, this is it's a it's a gross um, it's a gross infringement of people's rights. You know, these people are they're in their trucks, they're there overnight. They need fuel for heat. Some of them, like there's a, a there's a crew of Sikh guys who brought their trucks, and they're in the truck with their wife and their fam- and their kids, right? Because some of these cabs are quite large. Like mine's a, a quite large cab, right? Where you have a double bunk and you can sit in the front and all that sort of stuff, right? So now these these families, thank God it's a little bit warmer these few days. But what are you going to starve these people and let them freeze in the cold? Justin Trudeau, Mr. Diversity, Diversity Blackface, you're going to you're going to starve these Sikh families in the truck who just came to Canada because they want freedom and they're being restricted from it. Like that's that's the level we've devolved to, right? And you know, I gave a speech on the. Um, at the stage at uh, on Parliament Hill yesterday, and that was really outreach to the Liberal MPs. Because I'm curious, is is this what they signed up for? To be an international embarrassment? To tell their kids, their grandkids in the future, when the largest unity party in Canada was created and people drove across the country for a week just under the auspice of freedom, I was there to crush them. Like, is that what, that's what they wanted? That's what, thinking, that's what their legacy is going to be? Because that's what just Justin Trudeau's legacy is going to be. Yeah, well, it, it's, it's disturbing, right? Because you still have legacy media saying, well, why do they have so much fuel? What are they planning to do? It's like, you're idiots. That's for heating. You're in Ottawa. That's, right. that's what it, it is for. And I, I saw this video, I think it was from a virtual city council meeting uh, in oh, Ottawa, yeah. where essentially they said, you know, I think it was the chief of police telling the mayor, you know, we've we worked with GoFundMe to take their money away, but they're on a different platform now. So we're going to have to come up with a different strategy to basically starve them out. And that is what what is seemingly going on is they're trying to, to starve you out, which is beyond messed up. Uh, given that there are children, I mean, it, it, there's so many factors. Like, this is not how you de-escalate a situation at all. Uh, that's right. That, that's how, like, Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein would have de-escalated a situation. Or the Communist Party of China, they would starve their people. Well, that's what's happened to Canada's co- political class. They've now devolved to starving their citizens. Think about that. Yeah, it, it's it's super messed up. So with that in mind, I mean, so it sounds like they seized some jerry cans, uh, but has that affected the overall movement? I mean, you guys, it sounds like you're there to stay. Is there any is there any doubt in that? What what's the future looking like? Um, you know, the morale is still surprisingly upbeat. You know, last night. I was sit here <laughs> incapacitated and, you know, we got many different crews in different places. Uh, I told a couple of the guys, listen, do me a favor, go out, go talk to people and take some video, see how people are doing, uh, you know, give them a morality boost that they know we're here. We're all working on it. The command center is there working through the night sort of thing. And they said to me, yeah, we came back and people are, they're surprisingly upbeat. And uh, as one of them said to me, I can tell you our political leaders have massively underestimated the resolve of these people. And I said to them, well, yeah, that's kind of what I thought, because when you meet, you know, truckers from 
in rural Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, people in the logging industry. Like there's, there's a whole spectrum of truckers. But the guys who are in heavy fuel and logging, that's a certain type of grit and a certain type of strength and stubbornness that people in urban centers cannot even conceptualize. They don't know what motivation is like these people do. So their resolve is off the chart. Um, and because of that, and because they they live challenging lives, like you imagine <clears throat> you're, you're, you're a driver, you're a logger who is 20 hours north of the closest town. Your truck is a completely self-sustained truck with additional fuel tanks and an APU and all that sort of stuff. And if you get a flat tire on the side of the road, you got to fix the tire on, on your own and make sure that you have a gun on you in case a bear comes to kill you. Like that's the type of people that our government is fighting with, is arguing with right now, right? And they think those people are going to back down. And what's interesting is when they keep trying to bait people into uh, reacting with uh, violence, like that's what the government's trying to do. That's why you saw that uh, disgusting uh, Ottawa City Council meeting. It was absolutely disgusting. And you could see they're trying to bait these people, but they forget a couple of things. First, these people are not dumb. They know street smarts. That's, they may not be academics and PhDs, but they understand people more than, better than any of those people in that room. But yeah. at the same time, they work in a very regulated industry you know, with ELDs and DOTs and you know, they're small business people. So they have bookkeepers and accountants. And they're, they're not dumb people at all. Those are your small business people. They're just a very strong uh, small business people with a lot of grit who are self-sustaining. And they also understand because these people um, have devices like this. And who knew t uh, trucker TikTok is a whole world, right? Like who would have imagined that? And they understand that they're not going to take the bait because it's an information war. It's a PR war. They know that. They're not going to pick a fight with any cop. They're not stupid. They know what that will lead to. So all the, the crying and crowing of this is January 6th, they're going to pull a January 6th, and all the truckers are sitting back saying, yeah, they don't understand. We know exactly what they're trying to do. It ain't happening. We got all the time in the world. Is that's, that's their approach. Yeah. Well, that, I think that stoic approach is what's resonated with people is that, well, first of all, like you said, these aren't your upper class college kids that, uh, that cry the moment, uh, anything yeah. goes wrong. These are tough guys. But on top of that, they're, they're very stoic in the sense that they understand that this is a PR war. Mm -hmm. And while we're there, while true North is there, rebel news, other independent media is there trying to show what's really going on. They understand that you talk to legacy media, they're going to slice and dice everything you say. They that's understand right. that any, anything you anything that looks weird, anything that, and that's why I'm so weary of the few bad actors that are that are carrying these flags and everything. Because I'm thinking these guys aren't aren't that stupid to do that, you know? Like the, these, there's clearly you know some bad actors involved but i think for the most part you know you look at some of these truckers and it's like man this guy looks like he's been through stuff he's not going anywhere uh that's the vibe i get so a it's, lot of veterans a lot of veterans a lot of right veterans, a lot of people from veteran families uh so you want to talk about people who are patriotic about their country and serving them like when when the you know the the war memorial thing was a complete hoax right you know that First, it was a trucker parked on the war memorial, then somebody stepped on it, and then somebody urinated on it, right? Because every time you disprove one, it's, oh, well, this happened. Well, no, that didn't happen. I, oh, well, this, uh, this is what our fake news media has devolved into. But even the whole idea of the war memorial being desecrated upset them so much. Many of us were, were appalled just by the idea that the media would even suggest it. So what they did 
is they got their shovels out because they all have them in the trucks and they shoveled all the snow around the war memorial started cleaning up picking up the garbage around it you know just from the city not giving the due care that it requires in the winter because you know they were so hurt emotionally they went out of their way to um, clean up and protect the the war memorial and the tomb of the unknown soldier because many of them have experienced you know real tragedy in their lives you know on the battlefield and um, it was touching it was it was really touching to see them make that gesture and that is uh, conducive to the nature of the people who are here uh, wanting their freedoms because so many of them actually went and saw their brethren die for freedom that's that's how they they view it yeah well i i think i think it matters to hear that again because i don't even know if we were aware of that we might have been maybe i wasn't working that day but again these are stories that you don't hear uh yeah. and i don't want to make this whole thing just attacking legacy media although i'd love to um <laughs> but i think it's it okay i'm taking care of that for you don't okay, worry Okay, perfect you're, you're doing my job but it matters right because i think the vast majority of people and i say this all the time they're not news junkies like me or like you they go to work nine to five they come home right. a lot of people turn on you know cbc at six o'clock and then that's all the news they get and that's all they know because they don't have the bandwidth just because of life to scroll through tons of of content for so sure. yep the better you guys are at amplifying truthful voices, the better it is for the movement and for the truth itself. So that's why I, I commend you for what you're doing. And again, it's not just you. I don't want to just, you know, boost no, your no. ego. Uh, no, you're, you're sort of just the mouthpiece of, of the movement, uh, but it's really incredible. And I want to thank you for coming on. My pleasure. And uh, listen, reach out anytime. I'm, I'm wondering, I'm just curious, do you have any idea? Um, have have your analytics increased uh, over this past uh, few days since we've kind of gone this route of reaching out to select media and alternative media? Has it helped? Oh, yeah. Millennium? Yeah, for sure. For sure. It, it's I mean, traffic alone, you know, when we when we look at everything that's been going on, you know, we're a Canadian outlet. We report on American news, but we're a Canadian outlet. And I think, like I said at the beginning of this conversation, the world's eyes are on Canada right now. Yeah. Uh, and for so long, we haven't had any really good Canadian content to talk about. We've just been doing American. We had the election. So we've always done well there. But this has been a Canadian destination. This is home for us. This has sort of been our moment to seize. So yeah, it's, it's been, it's been incredible. We've, we've gotten a ton of support and we've had really prominent figures that have, you know, even just our content on Twitter, our videos, right? The video of the, the, you know, the video of what's going on, the parties and everything. I mean, and that, Andy know is wonderful. Yeah. Well, and, Andy's, people. Andy's a great guy and he's supportive. Yeah. And, you know, we've had Jordan Peterson like retweeting every single video we've put up basically. So mm -hmm. it's been, it's been, it's been great. It's been great that we're able to get the message out. Cool. Cool. Yeah. All right, man. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on and I'll let you know, I mean, keep me posted on everything that's going on and we'll see what happens. Will do. We'll talk to you soon. All right. That was Benjamin Dichter. You can find him on Twitter under Benjamin Dichter. Please consider going to givesendgo.com. If it's slow, please have patience. The website is being attacked by malicious actors, but givesendgo.com is where you can donate to the Truckers Convoy if you are interested in doing so. Uh, until next time, my name is Angelo Sodoro. Let me know who you want to see next, and I'll try to make it happen if I seem important enough to them for them to come on and so on. But I'll try. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.